from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, the weather's changing and harvest is still standing for some in the Northern Plains. The president reducing the size of monuments in Utah and agribusiness wheat price expectations. I'm actually more optimistic about wheat prices than I am anything else. Really? Is... A cheese making veteran discusses the changes he's witnessed in his long career in Wisconsin. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado. High strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. After a mild fall for much of the Great Plains and Midwest, it appears we're getting a stark reminder that we are in December and that winter will officially arrive in three weeks. The season's first major winter storm striking North Dakota on Monday. This is what it looked like in Bismarck. Strong winds kicking up snow. It was still light enough that you could use a leaf blower to clear the sidewalks. Blizzard warnings posted as winds gusted up to 50 miles an hour. Snowfall accumulations ranging from three to six inches. The storm pushing eastward across the Red River Valley into Minnesota. The North Dakota State Patrol says Interstate 29 had a quarter mile visibility. The roadway slush and snow cover was up to the Canadian border. Travel conditions were tricky. Before the snowstorm arrived, some farmers in North Dakota were still trying to bring in some of their still standing corn. Drought conditions delaying development of the crop, and with prices bottoming out, some farmers aren't planning on harvesting until next spring. Cliff Naylor from affiliate KFYR reports. The pace of the corn harvest in North Dakota has been slow and steady. Most of the crop has been cut but hundreds of acres are still standing. You look around, there's quite a bit of corn around the country, and I've talked to a few guys, and there's still 18, 19, 20 plus percent moisture, and a lot of people don't have air bins to put it in or, and dry it. Michael Rogstead does have dryers, and he's cutting his crop before it snows again. Rogstead is usually finished combining corn by mid-November, but this year's drought slowed crop progress. Then an early frost further stifled its dry down. Once it freezes, it's just harder to bring that moisture down. Um, it, it is coming down still, but rather than losing a point today, we're maybe losing a point in a month. Rogstead says it doesn't pay to dry down the corn that's left standing. It's, it's really not a money maker this year, and every penny you got to put into drying it or harvesting it, it's money out of your pocket. With low prices, some farmers are opting to let the crop stand and risk having it dry down over the winter. There's the yield loss. You could lose up to 50% of your yield. It's not a good thing, especially with prices where they're at, but with again, with prices where they're at, a lot of guys don't want to pay the drying charges. For some farmers, Mother Nature will be responsible for getting the crop ready to cut next spring. I'm Cliff Naylor, reporting for Ag Day. Well, it's a late harvest for Rogstad. There's not a big problem statewide. In the last crop progress report of the season issued a week ago, 94% of corn was harvested. The statewide five-year average is 95%. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue predicting fiscal year 2018 farm exports will remain strong. Fiscal year 2017 closing with the third highest total on record. The Department of Agriculture's export forecast rolled out last week. USDA predicting farm exports for 2018 fiscal year will reach a value of $140 billion. That's the fourth best year in history. Ag trade surplus is expected to grow 8% to $23 billion next year. Currently, exports generate about 20% of U.S. farm income. A new report from CoBank says 2018 could bring an increase in profit margins for grain elevators. That report citing a weak harvest basis along with low transportation rates and other issues for the prospect of improved profit margins. The administration announcing plans to shrink two national monuments in Utah. The decision getting mixed reviews from stakeholders. Trump's decision would scale back the 1.4 million acre Bears Ears and 1.9 million acre Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments. The move would be the most significant reduction ever to a previous president's National Monument designation. Now the Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Public Lands Council releasing this video of Bears Ears to demonstrate what it says are massive swaths of range and grassland included in that National Monument designation, adding that much of the monument land does not contain the historic landmarks or historic and prehistoric structures that the Antiquities Act was intended to protect. Well, this is an issue that we've been hammering for so long, it's really gratifying that the administration is starting to take some steps to reduce these 
enormous monument designations that have been made over the past eight years and really 25 years going back to the Clinton administration and the Grand Staircase Escalante designation. These decisions expected to be challenged in federal court by environmental and Native American groups that support the protection and designation. Farmers scoping out the blood moon and have some pretty incredible pictures to show for it. Mike Hoffman has that in today's crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Take a look at this shot. Tom Jones in Indiana snapping this beautiful picture of Sunday's super moon. What a picture that is. Here are some other incredible photos from McCade Morrison over in Logan, Iowa. McCade took these pictures between 515 and 720 p.m. And what a sight that is as well. And here's a snapshot of something not as welcoming, snow in North Dakota. DJ Morast in Daisy, North Dakota says everything is covered in a coating of white. This is around an inch of snow as of Monday morning. And taking a look at the weather map, that storm is now moving east. Lots of showers and thunderstorms through the uh, eastern and southeastern parts of the country. Snow and much colder farther north. We'll have your forecast coming up in a few minutes, but first here are some hometown temps. Farm Journal on Air is the go-to app for American agriculture. Ag Day, AgriTalk, U.S. Farm Report, and more. 24-7 access to all of your favorite shows, TV and radio. In your hands, on demand. Farm Journal on Air. Download the app today. As winter wheat heads into dormancy, what should we expect for wheat prices in the months ahead? We'll take a closer look at analysis. Plus, we meet a Wisconsin cheesemaker who has seen a lot of changes in the cheese industry during his half-century on the job. And if you partake in No Shave November, you'll want to stick around for In the Country. Ag Day, brought to you by Alevo Seed Treatment from Bayer. Protect your soybeans from SDS and nematodes this season. Let's see how markets started the week. For that, we head to the floor of the CME in Chicago. Today, cattle was falling yet again. Long liquidations really weighed heavy on the futures. We've uh, made it to a new five-week low, and that's based on uh, the uh, on the idea that there's concerns that the supplies are just too much. A lot of non-commercial uh, uh, selling, and they're reducing their long position. Now, the funds are still a little bit long, but they've been reducing it steadily, and uh, it's not looking good right now. Live cattle is really down about $3 uh, to a $3 discount, uh, and it makes it very easy uh, for the buyers to kind of like uh, uh, slip their, the producers to, you know, slip their bids even lower. Today, soybeans were up again. Fun buying were adding to the already long positions and really gave the market a boost. Technically speaking, though, we we reached a top and we're, you know, here above that $10 mark and it seems difficult to, to move higher, although experts were saying that we they keep the they expect the range to be from 1040 down to 960. But it is showing a little bit of an overbought condition. The RSI is a little bit high and the fundamental news is actually on the bearish side. You know, first of all, the U.S. dollar index is a little bit strong right now and it has been going up along with the stock market uh, as well as weather in Brazil. Brazil actually, actually has been pretty good, even though Argentina is a little bit behind schedule on getting uh, some of their corn and beans in the ground. That's all from the floor at the CME Group. I'm Virginia McGathy here in Chicago. Winter wheat is in the ground and spring wheat has a few months left before planters start to roll. So what should we expect for prices going forward? Ty Morgan asked a question in today's Analysis from the Row. Here now with Angie Setzer of Citizens Grain. Angie, wheat has not been a fun topic no. really on this show to talk about. No. I mean, when you look at prices, uh, no wonder that we're going to see another record low uh, wheat acreage possibly mm -hmm. uh, with, with planting next year. So when you look at wheat prices, do you think that will budge? Do you think that prices can actually move higher? Yeah, I do. I'm actually more optimistic about wheat prices than I am anything else. Really? Yeah, I am going to go into my own little corner and sit and think about what I just said. But the reality <laughs> is wheat, you know, the, the record low acres, the fact that we've seen, you know, production issues around the world, Australia is going to have some real issues here. We're not really encouraging expansion anywhere. And the fact is, is that everyone talks about these huge global stocks. Well, 48% of them are sitting in the hands of the Chinese, and those are not coming into the world pipeline anytime soon, if at all. Well, they're, they're really not going to come into the world pipeline. So the fact remains that we can talk about these huge global stocks all we want, but the reality is 48% of them are, aren't really there to a certain extent. So that and a, a production shortage or a production hic hiccup anywhere, we're starting to see some dry weather remain in the, the hard red spring area, starting right. to 
work its way in. Uh, the Southern Plains haven't had the, the greatest fall. They went from, from wet to they're starting to dry out as well. We've got right. some La Nina impacts. Yep. Um, I, I know that I was in Michigan this past weekend and the crop really doesn't look all that great there. So reality is cash market is starting to really firm. Uh, I think we'll start to see some of those spreads come in. We're seeing some changes in the overall fundamentals of what the farmers are getting. And so I, I am optimistic on wheat prices. It may take some time. Last year I was bullish all year and finally we saw the rally in June. So I don't know if that counts as being right or not, but <laughs> uh, it may take some time, but I feel that farmers will have an opportunity to sell wheat at a, a reasonable level and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens from there. All right, Angie, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be back with more Ag Day in just a moment. For help solving your cash grain problems, call Angie Setzer with Citizens LLC at 800-858-3738. Back to Ag Day, your meteorologist Mike Hoffman looking at the weather as it turns colder for a big part of the country this week. This is it, east of the Rockies. This is where winter begins right. over the next 24 hours. In some areas, it's already begun. And that would be across the northern plains where it is already turning up much colder with some areas of snow. There's a fair amount of snow in uh, uh, south central Canada with this system as it continues to move northeast. But this is the first blast of cold air. There'll be many more coming showers and thunderstorms by later today up and down the eastern seaboard into the southern Appalachians and down toward the Gulf Coast. Behind it then little areas of snow here and there. There's going to be a fair amount of lake effect in some areas over the next uh, couple of weeks. Actually, we're going to uh, be talking about lake effect and you folks in the west. Basically, you don't have a lot going on over the next uh, week or two because you're just going to have a high pressure building in most of the time. But you can see there will be a little moisture here and there from that stream coming into uh, the far southwest with a little bit of rain and snow. That's how cold this air is. Uh, it will actually produce some snow all the way down into West Texas by the time we get to tomorrow morning in places anyway. And you can see as we head through the rest of the day tomorrow, the lake effect starts to kick in pretty good. These are multiple little systems just kind of coming in, reinforcing the cold air and bringing a little bit of snow with them. None of these will be heavy at all, though. Wait till you see the jet stream. That's why we were confident this cold air is here to stay for a while. Precipitation estimate over the past 24 hours from northeast Texas into the Ohio Valley. We've seen a half inch to an inch here and there. Adding in the next 36 hours, you can see how uh, it will continue to progress eastward toward the eastern seaboard. Some of the far northern places may end up with a couple of inches of uh, liquid. That would be either rain or melted snow, and that's the same idea in uh, west Texas into the far southwest. Snowfall estimates the heaviest over uh, eastern Dakotas into uh, northern Minnesota the past 30, 24 hours. The next 36, then, most of it really is going to be across Canada. We'll see some uh, decent amounts in places in the Great Lakes, but for the most part, nothing real heavy. And West Texas, like I said, getting a little bit there. Highs today, uh, well, we're going to see uh, the, them turning chillier, but lows tomorrow morning already into the 30s, down to Memphis, down to uh, Tulsa. We're looking at teens in the far northern plains. Highs tomorrow only in the 20s through the northern tier of states, and there's much colder air in Canada that's going to continue to come southward out of this. But these are pretty chilly numbers throughout the southeast, as you can see, except for central and south Florida. There's the jet stream. This is, again, just the start of the cold air. You can see little bursts of it there, little pieces of energy kind of coming southward like that little batch Friday and Saturday. Another one coming for Monday and Tuesday. This is a stable weather pattern where the cold air just keeps coming southward. So we'll see how long it lasts. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Fresno, California, first of all. Morning frost, then sunny and nice, high of 56 degrees. Ironwood, Michigan, cloudy with a bit of snow, high of 23. And finally, Lynchburg, Virginia, cloudy and mild with afternoon showers, the high up to 61 degrees. Chocolate milk is headed back to school lunchrooms. We'll have details next, and we'll answer one of the most complex questions to face mankind. How do you keep your beard smelling sweet? Yeah, we're not kidding. Details as we head in the country. Receive a free trial of the Daily Grain Plan newsletter from Roach Ag Marketing. Text ROACH to 31313. Start your subscription today by texting ROACH to 31313. The Dairy Report on Ag Day is brought to you by QLF. For 40 years, QLF has been proud to support American farmers that feed the world. 
On the Dairy Report, our partners at Dairy Herd Management reporting that Beringer Ingelheim will invest $80 million to expand its vaccine facilities. The manufacturing centers in Athens, Georgia and St. Joseph, Missouri are expected to add more than 100,000 square feet. This follows the company's acquisition of animal health business Marielle in early 2017. And chocolate milk is set for a return to school lunch rooms. The USDA publishing a new interim rule set to start on July 1st that allows 1% flavored milk back into cafeterias across the country. It also relaxes sodium and whole grain requirements. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue says schools need flexibility and they want to offer food that students will eat. When Tom Jenny started working in Wisconsin's cheese industry, Lyndon Johnson was president. The TV show Batman debuted with Adam West as the Cape Crusader and the Yankees traded home run champ Roger Maris. Suffice it to say, Jenny has seen a lot of changes both in the country and in the cheesemaking industry. In this video provided by the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board, meet a Wisconsin master cheesemaker who looks back fondly on a career that spanned decades. It's hard to imagine doing the same job for 51 years, but for Tom Jenny, being a Wisconsin cheesemaker was his life's calling. I just fell in love with it, decided I like, like taking milk and turning it into something a person can eat, good wholesome food and I just kind of stayed with it. His cheesemaking career began at his dad's cheese plant in Platteville, where he worked for 33 years. He then worked for a few other Wisconsin cheese companies prior to spending the last 13 years of his career at Car Valley Cheese, crafting award-winning cheese. But now that he's retired, what will he miss the most about making cheese? Camaraderie. The cheese industry isn't that big, so you, you, you have a lot of friends and uh, I could call any of my friends up right now and go up and see them for a day and I could talk all day with them. So uh, I like the camaraderie. Tom was fortunate to work in an industry that has seen a lot of change during his tenure with the growth of Wisconsin specialty and artisan cheeses. Sid was a fore forerunner of that. Uh, started making artisan cheeses. I really didn't get into that until probably when I started working for Sid in 2004. Then I really got into the artisan stuff. We started making American Originals because uh, we had plant capacity, we had stores to sell it in, and it, we saw it as an opportunity to do uh, more than what we were doing and really to um, make it more interesting for our cheesemakers. Not only was Tom at the forefront of artisan cheesemaking, he was also a member of the first Wisconsin Master Cheesemaker Program graduating class in 1997. I became a master cheesemaker. That was a highlight of my career, actually. For about three or four years in a row, we won a lot of awards with my Swiss cheese, so I was happy about that. And that's Wisconsin Dairy News. Is it time to shave that beard in the country is next. Unlock the power of ag technology this December in Indianapolis at the first ever ag tech expo. Learn all about it at farmjournalagtech.com. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit Kubota.com today. Well, it's not exactly a problem for me, but for many bearded fellas, it's a conundrum as old as time. And that's how to keep a beard smelling clean and fresh after eating messy food. Now, I'd like to say we're kidding, but of course, we're not. Beards are taken very seriously here at the Gentleman's Grooming Show in London, England. This is the place if you come that you want your facial hair blow dried to perfection. But no matter how well you groom your beard, what happens when you eat messy food? Well, one Italian thinks he's found the answer. He created the Beard Doctor perfume and just in time for Christmas. I'm sure Santa will be thrilled. The spray is designed to absorb quickly into the beard, making it smell oh, fresh and clean. What happened after eat? What about you know, you're doing sport, especially like eat seafood? You can go to it, clean your, your beard, but still, it's gonna be all smelly. And I thought, I need something I wanna carry on all the time with me, but not too big, so it's for this the car. And use it after it to avoid all this bad smell. The beard doctor says most of his customers are women. We're guessing they're picking something up for a husband or boyfriend. One and a half ounce bottle goes for $67, and it smells of mint and eucalyptus. By the way, the big talk at the beard show this year, fashion folks say beards might be on the way out. Many young men are back to the clean shaven look these days. 
That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. For Mike Hoffman and all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Ag Day, brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups.